Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So tell me about your podcast. Uh, my podcast is called Fear It Goes. And it's funny, when I started a year ago, it was the podcast all about taking your fears with you and doing it anyways. Then as the prod cast progresses, which is pretty standard as you progress and kind of find your voice and figure out what you want to offer. Um, the podcast kind of shifted when I went into the sex series, because at that point, I really, really got heavily into belief systems that we carry inside and challenging those belief systems, because beliefs really are all the lies we tell ourselves. So are you going to tell yourself lies that function well for you? Or are you going to tell yourself lies and keep those lies that don't work for you. And the sex series was really about discovering what's important to you and not taking in all the influences and conditioning from outside you. So um, that really kind of changed my perception of what I wanted to bring to people. I wanted to really offer them something that made them go, hmm, maybe that's something I need to look at right? Instead of just these really inspirational stories, which were great. And don't get me wrong. I love those still too, right? Because we need to know that we can aspire to be bigger, better, more authentic people. Absolutely. And what happens in that journey. However, um, as the podcast has progressed, even from the sex series, now I'm in the health series, I'm talking about what health really is. And health is a plethora of things. It's not just the physical. So in the beginning of the series, I was talking about your physical state. And um, like I talk about the microbiome because I've studied it extensively for a long time. I'm rather obsessive obsessive about it. And I teach a form of keto um, because it really does reduce all all the carbs we should... Let me rephrase that. I don't like that word. Should is kind of a funny word. (laughs) All of the carbohydrates that aren't necessarily functioning well in our bodies, right? So um, fruits and vegetables, there's a big misunderstanding around the macros in general. So, you know, I kind of talked about some of this stuff at the beginning. And then I had a um, a functional medicine practitioner come in. So these guys are like the extreme of nutritionalists, Mm -hmm. but it's awesome because they break down, again, what is the healthiest diet for us? And, and how do we function most optimally? And he and I had a really nice lovely conversation. I got to talk to him forever. <laughs> and then I did one on sugar and we talked about sugar in the body and I talk about sugar replacements and how to do that in a healthy way um, and where to find some of these things because some people are like, what, what's that? They don't even know, right? Um, and then I, I actually just did one on caregivers because, and I, I refer to caregivers a, a little bit differently. You're using a very um, literal mm-hmm. sense of the word, right? I am taking care of someone. I'm not getting paid for this necessarily, right? Which is most of the case, most of the cases for caregivers like this. Um, and they're in a terminal illness or they require, like they have a disability or they require a additional help. And I am that help. Right. Cool. So um, that's what you and I will talk about today. But the caregiver I talked about was the role of caregiver and how we have all these roles within us, but caregiver tends to play out most destructively or can, let, let me rephrase that. It can play out destructively. Caregivers are some of the most amazing people because they're so kind and so big hearted, but they don't know how to feed themselves. And then that's where it becomes really destructive to them, right? Really, really depletive. And like the extent to which people do this is mind boggling to me. Yeah. The, um, it's a scary statistic. 65% of caregivers are hospitalized or pass away before the person they're caring for. 18% are the ones that pass away first. And right. that's terrifying. And when you're taking care of somebody with a cognitive disability, like Alzheimer's or dementia, right. Which I mean, it's just, you know, and it's like, you have no idea. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you know, there is one, but like for me, we've been doing this for about 20 years. Yeah. My mom has pretty much entered the late stages, although she is still very verbal, which yeah. is not always a good thing. 
<laughs> and she, you know, she's starting to have troubles eating and she, you know, she's losing other abilities, which are a sign of the late stage. But if somebody just saw us sitting outside on the bench chatting and she's having yep. one of her better days, they'd be like, oh, no, no, she's not in the later stages because she's not forgetting words right. and she's not forgetting language. And I'm like, well, yeah, she actually is. But it's mm -hmm. it's just fascinating because well, everybody is so day. different. Hmm? Well, it, d dementia is such a I, this is why I changed my diet actually. And this is why I talk about what I do because I read, oh, actually it goes back even before that. So I was certifying for a designation back when I was in finance and, um, and we had a guest speaker come in and she was talking about dementia specifically. And she was talking about what it's like in hospitals or in the care centers with dementia patients. And Oh, I just got shivers. <laughs> um, and honestly, it was like heart breaking to hear these stories about these families who literally watched this person fade out in front of them. So from the family side, which is horrendous. And then there's the other side of the person who's actually experiencing it. And they are frustrated and angry because they know these are parts of something that was their life. And they're just grasping at anything they can remember anything and their life is slowly eroding in front of them and they know it and they can't do a thing about it yeah my mom so, has gotten she gets violently combative when you yep. have to help her yeah and this is new and it frustrates me because the staff where she lives will say oh she was so easy i don't understand i'm like yeah it's the she evolution was easy. of the illness well but she wasn't an easy person and she was very independent very you know this is how it's going to get done. You know, she wasn't like a pushover or, you know, yeah. a wimp, you know, that's not the kindest term, but she wasn't a pushover. She, and she was assertive and she, she was, could be. and she knew what she wanted and how mm -hmm. she wanted it done. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, when somebody says we're going to take a shower now, ugh, I mean, she's drawn blood on my husband and she's drawn blood on caregivers. And I tried to trim her nails on Monday and she decided to call me all sorts of names and tell me to drop dead and then proceed to try to scratch the flesh off my hands. And I'm like, oh, oh hell no, honey, we're not going there. <laughs> so it's part of been... that too, she had control, right? All that stuff, she was able to control herself. And now someone else is saying, you have no control over what's going on in your life. I do. Take it. And she's like, I don't want that. Yeah, I want to no. control this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. And I, I prefer not to medicate it, you know, right. we're going to have to add a, like another medication because the, the Seroquel, which is supposed to help keep them calm is not working. I mean, obviously yeah. <laughs> she's right. scratching and screaming and swearing. and it's pretty, pretty unpleasant. Violent but, tendencies become more and more predominant as the, the disease progresses until they kind of forget everything or get into that stage if they're still around. And then sometimes that violence will slowly taper off because they're no longer, they're no longer there that way. They're no longer remembering that they are forgetting. Yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know. I, I have fears because she's still very ambulatory. She does have um, arthritis yeah. in her hips. And so there, there are days when she probably has refused to take her medication that she has a lot of pain while she's yeah. walking. And so she doesn't, you know, obviously you're not going to take her for a walk when it hurts every two steps. Right. But I have this fear of this woman wandering around muttering like a zombie before she goes. And I've, I've talked, I've read a, a yeah. I don't know, a story article about a girl. That's exactly what happened to her dad. He was like obsessed with zombies as a, an adult person. And he, he was verbal up until the day he died and walking. Yeah. but just not in any normal quote Coherent. unquote sense of the way that's like, Oh, yeah. lovely. So that one of the things that I know from talking to lots of caregivers and the caregivers in my support group is one of the biggest challenges is taking care of yourself. And my yep. mom is in memory care and it's still, there are days when it's like, you know, Monday she was fighting with me Tuesday. I'm in a workshop with the Alzheimer's association and, Yep. And they're calling me because mom's being combative and, oh, maybe she should go to the doctor. And it's like, oh, hell no, I'm done with her doctor. That's, that's another thing. That's I got to spend time yep. finding a new doctor, 
you know, getting her on the palliative care through the hospice company that took care of my dad and getting different high capacity diapers instead of the depends. It's like, ugh, I have a life. And this is just from somebody who is, whose family member is in a very good memory care residence. So the people right. who are taking care of their loved ones at home, like I have a past guest friend who's in my support group. She, her dad goes to daycare four days a week. And she says, you know, she knows that she needs to start exercising because she's got a lot of pain and, and issues yeah. associated with aging and stress. And, and she just can't bring herself to do it. And I think part of it is we throw up mental barriers like, you know, well, I got to get, in the, I got to go to the gym or I got to get in the car or I got to walk the dog. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if, if we can. Yeah, I talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's what we planned on talking about today was what can we do? you know, when we're essentially trapped at home with somebody who's like, why are we doing this? I don't understand. Ah, that's my mother. <laughs> right. You know, she told me the other day, I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Open the door, take her into the, to the, you know, the public bathroom in the memory care. Why am I in here? Because you said you needed to use the bathroom. Oh, so I go in here. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> here. Yes. And then she's standing on the side of the toilet and she's about to sit sideways, which that's not comfortable at all. So I, I have to pivot her and get her to shift over about two steps, which she wasn't real thrilled with that. She was, you could see it in her face. Like, why are you having me do this? Which, you know, then I get frustrated and it shows on my face and she picks that up. This is, this is where it's really easy to trigger them. Right. So I said, okay, now I'm like, okay, now, now you can go. And she's like, you could tell she, I'm like, just take off your pants and go. I'm like, why am I having to, I'm like every step of the way I have to explain to her how to use the toilet. Because she's kind of regressing in some ways back to childhood. Right. And it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah the week before I just had to verbally talk and her it, through it this week. It was like, no, I actually had to pull off her pants and, and knowing that she gets violent. The, well, and next her pants week. And, and next week might be, she'll remember everything and she'll be fine. That's the saddest part of dementia. Yeah. Honestly, that to me is the most terrifying disease and the interesting thing around dementia. So there's a lot of research around dementia and they're starting to think that they're like, it's diabetes type three. Yeah, I've read that. So um, a lot of dementia is linked and prevention is linked for many, many illnesses through our diet. Mm -hmm. So my question is, like, I have a weird question as you're sitting here talking about <laughs> um, the care that they give her. And I'm wondering, so are they giving her like omega-3s? Does she take like a fair amount of those? Does she take mm -hmm. coconut oil? Does she like, what fats is she taking in that help feed the brain so that she can function better? Um, I don't know about the fats, but she does have the she gets supplements that i provide yeah the problem is is there's certain medications she really needs yep. and one of them is really large and they they can't obviously well they're pills so the only way to give it to somebody would be the way you do it with a dog and i don't recommend that with a human <laughs> especially my you mother mean, come on yeah like, let me jab this down your throat <laughs> you, know? you can do this yeah, it's like, just, I mean, I hate doing that with the dog, but occasionally he gets on yeah. and I just, I'm like, no, you're taking this and I'm yeah. going to win. There's no way in heavens I would do that with my poor mother. <laughs> it would be very bloody, but she'll, she just refuses. They'll put it in her hand and she just hangs onto it. You know, this tight gripped hand yeah. fist and they'll be like, oh honey, you know, you need to, you need to take your medication. And she's like, what medication? And then they got to like, pointed out in her hand, which is clenched tight as, you know, tight yeah. fist. And that's one of the issues that we've dealt with lately is, you know, she's refusing to take her medications and, right. you know, they can put them in yogurts and stuff, but like literally one of these pills is at least half an inch long. It's really big. It I should see if they like can... the omegas I take. They're pretty large. Yeah, I've, I've got a supplement that's, it's like, you don't want to take two of them with everything else. Cause they're huge, but you know, I've, I will, I will drink enough water. The other thing with elderly and especially people with cognitive impairment is they don't like, I, I have to coax my mom into drinking like half a, half a glass of tea or 
the juice that they provide, which is low sugar. Um, she doesn't really like water. My mom and a lot of regular listeners have heard this. My mom used to drink two liters of Diet Coke every day. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> diet <laughs> means aspartame almost always. And aspartame creates, aspartame poisoning, poisoning creates lesions in the brain. <laughs> I believe it. And mimics MS. Interesting. So some MS diagnosis have actually been aspartame poisoning. It's fascinating the way that we fed ourselves, not recognizing what we're doing in the big picture. Yeah, poisoning ourselves. That's my poisoning biggest, ourselves. My biggest uh, challenge is eliminating the artificial sweeteners. Good girl. <laughs> I'm working on it, but... <laughs> You okay, know. so if, if it comes to things like stevia, stevia is kind of one of those ones that's weird. It's really good because it's natural, it's plant. I've grown it before. Um, stevia is very sweet on the front, really bitter on the back if you have too much. So I find I don't like the um, powder for stevia. I almost never use that, um, but I will use the drops and you can control it a lot more. So you use a little bit, you test it, you're like, okay, so three drops is right for me or to sweeten whatever this is. And, and then it's just normal. It's just like a nice sweetness, it tastes right, and you're not doing any harm to your body and it doesn't hit your glycemic index at all. Oh, I so, have to, of course, I just went to the health food store yesterday, <laughs> but I'll have to go back because I've tried the powdered stevia in tea Ugh. and it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that either. Well, uh, you'll, you'll like love either. me because I like <laughs> Splenda in my hot tea but I like the pink stuff in iced tea, the bad okay, stuff. Okay, <laughs> so remember the pink has got aspartame, so watch yep, that. Yep, that's bad, I know. And, and there's a whole bunch of those artificial sweeteners that actually do, it's funny because we think we're doing something good and it's like non-sugar, but really what it's doing is it's tricking the body. So the body wants more, like it doesn't, fa oh, there's so many problems with artificial sweeteners. So when you're doing sweeteners, try and go with, like natural ones as much as you can. Honey at least has decent properties um, if you're going to go with something like that. Um, but there's sugar alcohols. Some of them are better than others, and they all act differently, but erythritol specific. Okay, so um, there's one called xylitol. I've that one's great that one. for your teeth. Lots of people know about it for their teeth because there's xylitol candies and gums and things like that. Small doses of xylitol, totally great. Larger doses of xylitol will kind of loosen you up. <laughs> I have had that experience. I used to work next door to a sugar-free candy shop. Yeah, xylitol has that effect. So, um, but xylitol blends can be great. And erythritol does not touch. It gets digested in the stomach, not absorbed through different means in the body. So it's, it acts very differently in the body, erythritol does. So you'll see that when it comes to a lot of um, newer sweeteners, um, you'll see erythritol as part of the blend. Erythritol and monk fruit are great. Um, I like erythritol and stevia. Those also can work well. And then I also like erythritol and xylitol mix. So if I'm baking or doing stuff like that, it's pretty well almost a one-to-one -one ratio. It's great. You, well, I find them a little bit sweeter now because I've taken sugar out of my diet. So um, I, I use less. But um, to make the switch is actually not hard at all because they taste so similar and act similar, but they don't act similar in the body. Your body doesn't process them the same way at all. So the glycemic hits are nothing in comparison to sugar. I'll definitely go back tomorrow and find a better alternative because I haven't found a good alternative, which is why I'm still using the bad stuff. <laughs> But all I drink is water and tea. So I don't, I don't drink sodas. I don't drink alcohol. So I feel like, okay, this is the one bad thing that I'm doing to my system. Okay. So I have a question too with your mom and electrolytes. So if she doesn't like to drink, right, she's not getting in enough fluids and we need to be hydrated. You can get good hydration through electrolytes. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about what is that stuff? Gatorade, because oh, that's yuck, laughable. No. That's complete junk. But there All are just natural the colors electrolytes. of that make me nervous because it's so uh, you know, like anything that's bright blue or bright orange, it's like I don't know about that. <laughs> right. Not a natural looking product there. So if your mom's getting hydrated well, 
and her electrolyte levels are high or, or balanced, uh, she won't require as much water hmm. or as much intake of those fluids. She'll get some through her food too. So um, really look at getting electrolytes in. So what's a natural electrolyte? Coconut water. If she likes that, give it to her. She seemed, we were surprised she'll be in the memory care three years this month, meaning March. Yep. Is, February is pretty much over. And because, I mean, literally when my sister and I were kids, mom would have, you know, like a six inch glass of juice with breakfast. And yep. then once that was gone, immediately pour in the Diet Coke or in the winter, she would have hot tea. And then once she had like one or two mugs of hot tea, then it would be the Diet Coke. And she she drank that stuff until she moved into the memory care and we were going to put in like a mini fridge and stock her up because i thought this one was going to go through withdrawal it's just going to be ugly but moving her in was ugly because we waited <laughs> way too late but it had nothing to do with diet coke withdrawal <laughs> yeah but i think they're all like that they have to coax them into drinking you know four ounces of water you know it's right it's like trying to coax a two-year-old to eat broccoli it's really frustrating. Um, I was really but, lucky. Both my kids like broccoli. <laughs> oh, Thank oh, God. my daughter was a much better vegetable <laughs> eater than me. And so I would try not to let her know that, you know, mom didn't like broccoli or whatever, right. because I didn't want her to be like, oh, well, if mom doesn't like it, I'm not going to eat it, which fortunately she's, she's good that way. Um, but she likes stuff that's cooked. Like I, I've now like, I like roasted broccoli. I've, I guess I've passed through enough cycles of life that it's like oh I got, uh, roasted broccoli is okay i'm getting much better at my veggies but my dad was a crappy eater he could have done a fried hamburger patty mashed potatoes and peas or corn every night for dinner for the rest of his life so when my mom tried to add variety or yep. something healthy you know it was just, like no yeah it was like it wasn't worth the constant argument so they're you know they would eat bologna and white bread and American cheese. <laughs> okay, so this is interesting. Talking about him saying no and us digging our heels in about our diet, right? Whatever it is that we like to eat. Okay, so I have a little secret to tell you. This is very interesting about how we function. So we have all these bacteria in our gut, right? Microbiome. And we have trillions in and on us. More than our cells, actually. So we are a very true symbiotic host to these mm. things and we will <laughs> die before anything else without them so we need them now these little guys are constantly telling us what they want so our cravings are linked to which ones are dominant in our gut so mm. if you're craving okay so truth be told <laughs> before i learned all this stuff i'm pregnant with my first i totally eat healthy right that's that was pretty normal for me. I, I've always eaten a lot of fruits and vegetables. I've always had a pretty decent diet, or so I thought. Um, so first one, eat pretty healthy. I don't crave anything crazy. It's just a good, healthy pregnancy eating-wise. Second one, I'm not kidding. It was so hard to not eat cinnamon buns, to oh. not eat baked food, to not, like, all I craved was this. But, Sugar. Well, and processed, like white processed foods, right? So processed wheat, well, really mostly processed wheat and sugar. So um, fascinating part of that though, is that I didn't realize this, but my gut biome had shifted from pregnancy one to two. So depending on which bacterial strains are dominant will depend on what you crave. They signal to you feed me. I want to stay here. <laughs> right? So I'm the big one. I'm the big group at the party. I want to stay here. So you're going to give me what I want. So I'm going to tell you what to feed me. So all I wanted to do was feed this, this group of bacteria, the, you know, this group of strains that were dominant now in my system because something had gone awry whatever it was, I don't know, because I, you don't normally have big shifts in a microbiome unless, okay, things like um, I take antibiotics because antibiotics will wipe them out. Um, or I have some uh, digestive trauma and that will change it too. So anyways, 
it's interesting because your cravings have everything to do with what you're being told to eat. Well, it's funny when I was pregnant, you know, especially in the early stages when you're queasy a lot. <laughs> yeah. My body wanted nice, greasy cheeseburgers. <laughs> and greasy That's... cheeseburgers made me feel better. <laughs> the day that I had, well, I know raspberries was part of my breakfast. Not a good choice. <laughs> Just give me that damn back, cheeseburger. <laughs> well, you know, thankfully I've never had the issue of vomiting blood. So yep. when you vomit something up that's bright red, your first yep. instinct is, ah! Fortunately, right. that is not what blood looks like when you vomit it up. It is what it looks like when you vomit up raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my daughter's always been a huge beef lover. So that's kind of funny. And the only time, and I'm a huge sugar, it's, it's genetic. I know it is. My mom, my maternal grandfather, my maternal grandfather did not think a meal was done till he had dessert. I don't I know if that... Like that covered uh breakfast um but, <laughs> i used to live like that too <laughs> um well i used to weigh 250 daily. pounds so i radically changed the way i eat and i mean i thought i ate healthy i think i did but i eat a lot healthier now um yeah. so this has been like the last decade but just the other night i texted my husband and i said how about we have this um basically it's frika fried rice so instead of rice it's the frika grain i with- love frika I, I find it tastes just like brown rice. And if it's better for me, I'm all, right. I'm all about that. But I'm like, my body is telling me it wants veggies. And I have veggies with lunch and with dinner probably 95% of the days. Cause, and yep. I make my own breads. I do. Nice. I'm like, <laughs> my, my vice is a little bit of sugar and then those nasty artificial things in my tea. <laughs> That's <laughs> but my you're going to try vice. something new. So it's good. It's good. This, you know, um, <laughs> I figured, you know, well, something's going to get me, but at least, you know, between, I went from weighing 250 pounds with a very large family history of diabetes on my dad's side yep. to not weighing 250 pounds and I exercise. And if I don't exercise like five to six days a week, I start getting a little homicidal, get a little bit hard to deal with. So it's just interesting you know, we've, we've moved recently. And so all we were doing is walking the dogs. Last yep. week I got back on my bike. Holy hell, that was rough. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, we've been doing two and three and four mile walks and we got a, an elderly, elderly dog with, um, hip dysplasia. Our, yeah. Well, no, um, our back leg, arthro- nerve arthritis. There we go. And, you know, so he can't trek as far as the one that's almost three. And then the middle one is five and a half. So and she's got a little bit of early onset arthritis. So we can't walk, you know, five, six miles, which I don't know if I got that much time, but, you know, I, I had to change my whole workout at the beginning of the year because we moved, one of our instructors moved, they changed the times the classes started. It's like, ay, ay, ay. But yeah, getting back on my bike was very painful. <laughs> It's like, okay. And then this week I haven't been able to do it because I've had stuff going on in the mornings when I normally ride with the group. So it gave my butt time to recuperate. (laughs) Certain amino acids will help with the recovery on, on working out too. That's true. Uh, But we were going to talk. Yeah, go ahead. We're we're talking totally different stuff. So let's talk caregivers. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and all this is really important, but I just talked to somebody about food and that yep. was really fascinating. And it's, but it's helpful to keep telling people, you know, because I, I grew up not liking green veggies, not liking most cooked veggies. Right. You know, I was kind of more of the peas and carrots and corn. And I'm <laughs> in the San Francisco Bay Area, way out in the suburbs where we grow sweet corn. Nice. So it's heavily, we- I'm sure it's modified. It's, it's white and it's sugary. <laughs> it's so good. And it's so delicious. <laughs> oh, yes, it's wonderful. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't eat tons of it. You know, I'm a bad resident. I don't eat tons of it. And then we have cherries, lots of cherries. So those have a lot of sugar in them too. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, we just moved. I had a lot of my own fruit trees and the fruit trees in this house aren't old enough to produce any fruit. So, but I'll be walking to the farmer's market in about a month when yeah. it opens up. So I, it is possible to shift from not eating 
the way we should to eating much closer to the way we should. You just got to do it in little steps. That's how I lost the weight. That's how I shifted how I eat. So it is possible. So it's always a good thing to tell people over and over again. So they're like, fine, I give in. I'm going to try it. <laughs> well, part of, part of the hardest, I think the hardest thing for most people when it comes to shifting uh, in lifestyles, okay, is, and I'm talking diet lifestyles, um, is the concept around what we've been conditioned to believe, right? And the cultural, someone referred to this as the food pop culture. And I was like, that's a really interesting term, is the food pop culture or the pop culture around food. And what we believe is healthy. And then what we discover is healthy. Like I'm writing an article right now about fats and omega-3s and 6s specific and what they do in the body and why it's so important to get more omega-3s because the North American diet is producing with a typical, like typical everyday eats, we have about a 25 to one ratio in normal eating and it should be a four to one ratio. So four, four omega-6s to one omega-3. And honestly, if you can get more to the one to two or one to three, ratio, you're like laughing. You're laughing because the omega-3s do incredible things in your body and they govern so much and they make sure your adrenal glands are working and most people are running around with adrenal fatigue. I believe that. And well, this gal that thyroid talking... issues. And yeah. those two like are hand in hand, adrenals and thyroid. And literally just taking that supplement could make the world of difference cognitive awareness, brain fog, all these things are interacting with how much fats we get. Our brains have two thirds, are two thirds fat. And we think that we need all this glucose. We don't. And we get absolutely enough from fruits and vegetables, like absolutely enough. That's true. I think it's, it's funny. If I have a really bad night's sleep, it yep. only takes one. I will wake up and my body's like, yo, how about a donut? Let's go get some pastries. <laughs> Come on. I don't eat that. I mean, yeah. we moved, like I said, you know, a couple months ago. And obviously you get donuts and coffee for the people that are helping you. Well, all of us are older. None of us need donuts. So I got donut holes. And then I got, <laughs> I think, four regular donuts because there's only one flavor of the holes. And I cut them up into thirds or quarters. Yeah. And I think I had one hole and one quarter of the donut the whole day. and for a while there, nobody was eating them. I'm like, come on, gang, it's been pretty good money on the coffee, at least have that. They did end up disappearing, but it's like, I, you know, I, when I wake up, I like a savory breakfast, eggs and, yep. you know, whole wheat toast and that kind of stuff, which I said I'd make myself. And, you know, Beautiful. I don't, I mean, if I eat junky, sugary stuff, I'm just gonna be hungry in an hour. That's pointless, you know, so it's just amazing. It's fast, because that's a fast carb. It's not even yeah. like, that's remember I was saying the whole thing about macros and people just kind of like clump them all in. It's a carb, it's a fat, it's a protein, but it's not like that. We have fast carbs and slow carbs, right? Or complex carbs we have. Um, and, and then even inside those we have categories. And then you look at fats and I'm like looking at fats going, there are multiple things you get from fats and the one, yeah, we know trans fats are bad, but, Actually, we just know trans fats are bad, period. Yeah, don't but, eat those. But then there's fats that are absolutely great for the body and why. And it all has to do with like short, short chain, long chain, medium chains, what they're doing, how fast you're absorbing, whether they're hitting the liver and they have to be processed that way or not. Like there's a whole bunch of factors come into play. And then same thing with your proteins. Are they clean proteins or junky proteins? Like, am I eating pounds of bacon? I love bacon. I love bacon, but I don't eat it all the time. I have like because it's highly processed. Yeah, I have two slices a week, maybe three. Sometimes, if we're getting down to the end of the package, there'll be two on the place. Yeah, two bacon two slices delicious. of bacon a week. This is my max, and it's the reduced sodium because right. Ugh. Sometimes I'll have regular bacon. It's like what? Nah. <laughs> it's yep. too much salt. Totally agree. <laughs> Totally agree. You know, then, and when I eat too, something that's too salty, then my brain's like, we need to balance that. So please go lick the sugar bowl. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I 
I don't salts are important in our body to some extent. We absolutely need some. That's true. And I just learned from this other gal that I talked to that, and I just read an article on it too. It's like, so salt is obviously on the brain is mm. um, like kosher salt is super, super highly processed and we should just skip it. And then the salt that comes in the blue round container is highly processed, probably shouldn't have that one either. So you want a salt. Small amounts them. of that one aren't so bad though, because it's ionized or sorry, not ionized. It's um it's i it's got iodine in it right and iodine supports your thyroid so okay, we so do need some just small amounts i'm pretty for good. that not, type of salt well then this one um they're talking about like more natural salts like the himalayan salts the himalayan. that actually have the minerals in them i'm like okay. right <laughs> oh and there's so many yummy like gray salts are delicious um i've got a lava salt here a hawaiian mm. lava salt it's delicious um Ooh. so yeah, We're going and, to Hawaii in June. I'm going to get me some of that. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And the Himalayan salts are beautiful too. Like there's great salts out there that absolutely have way more nutritional value because you're getting your, your, so we just talked about macros, fats, proteins, and carbs, but then there's your micros and those are all your minerals mm -hmm. and your vitamins. And you need these things to function normal. So things I know like- I know there's a big thing on, you know, do we really need to take, you know, supplements essentially? Some yes, um, some no. I, I take, well, I take one for, it's called menopause combo. <laughs> okay. Works great. <laughs> All I gotta tell you, you know, <laughs> stupid name, works great. Um, I mean, the health food place, or the, it's called the health hut here in town. I went in five years ago five, six years ago. And I said, I'm like tired all the time. And this, and they're like, you need this. And it's a money back guarantee. I mean, it was like, I didn't even have to finish telling them <laughs> what the issues were. Of course it is run by women. So that helped. Um, and then I occasionally get um, hormonal migraines, even though as one of my past guests said, I'm fully paused and they, gave me, what was that? Um, oh, fudgy. What was I taking? Fever few. But I read an article where it said, you know, they, the ground that we're growing our food in, like I could eat organic and healthy and all, you know, go to all the farms around here and get the corn and the cherries and the, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's not like all that yummy stuff. <laughs> well, there's tomatoes. Um, and the, it's interesting because one of the farms one year like odd years is corn even years is tomatoes or vice versa so they remember. switch out their field that's good yeah that's actually it, a good sign a sign of a is. good farm so, yeah i mean i don't know if they should throw in a third one but yeah it's not corn every year or tomatoes every year but even doing that the soil is depleted from all these vitamins and minerals that we're we're not getting them in our food because they're not getting it from the ground so yes we need supplements regardless of how healthy we need that was that was the article that made me say, okay, 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 I'll take them. <laughs> it's, it's funny because, yes, there has been a lot of soil degradation um, or degradation. And a lot of that has to do with using, like, commercial farming uses um, pesticides and, um, and fertilizers, right? So the soil, often, they're not switching out their farms. They're not tilling it back underneath. They're not putting some of the stuff back in. And so the soil is degraded. However, there are certain supplements and it depends on where you live. Like I'm in Canada and vitamin D is an absolute. And more people wander around here not realizing that they need to take vitamin D because no matter what, summer or winter, we still don't get all of the D that we need. And D governs, governs nine systems in the body. It's super important that you take this or have this. You're in San Francisco, so I think you're probably in the okay zone. Like the closer to the equator you are, the the more true sunlight you're really getting. And I think it's 25 minutes in the sun gives you, or 15 minutes in the sun gives you 25,000 units of vitamin D. That's a lot. Like you're, yes, which says something about what our bodies need, right? So I don't take 25,000 units a day, but I do take 6,000 units a day. And when you look at, there's a D research um, facility, they are, 
the leaders in what they research and it's down in it's down in the US. Um, I watched a, a presentation by them and it was great. And he was talking about D and how these deficiencies show up. So D is one of those things you really have to supplement if you're north of like probably mid US, you should be supplementing. And as you get higher up, you probably need a little bit more, right? So, and then collagen is one of those things that we stop producing it at 25. That's your skin, that's your hair, that's your gut integrity. Like the lining of our intestines require a good collagen base. This is why bone broth is so great and why it's come out so much about drink bone broth, drink bone broth, because it's collagen heavy and it's a way for you to absorb it well in the body or take, take the powder or whatever. But we stop at 25 and by the time you're 30, it's on a really decent decline. <laughs> Right. And then we hear about things called leaky gut and we're like, well, what the heck is that? Well, it's your gut integrity. You need to, you need to reinforce your intestines and you, you will be able to absorb your vitamins better and your minerals better and all the things that your food is actually giving you. So can you imagine, even if your food was jam packed with everything you needed and your gut couldn't absorb it, you're just passing it anyways. That makes sense. Well, it's interesting so, about vitamin D, it, two things. When I get my mom, I like to take her outside for walks, which I said now that's getting a little more yep. complicated. But um, like I said, I'm in California and we're about to have another drought because it's supposed to be like in the mid upper 70s today. In, wow. And yeah. you guys are for February. Yeah. yeah, it's we may end up with a cold, damp March. Um, I'm not going to bet on that one you know, climate change and everything. Usually we have a drought every like four years, four or five years. We had, let's see, 2017, it was 16, 17 was pouring. A couple of years ago it was pouring. So it's, it's all different. But when I, my mom is outside in the sunshine, mm-hmm. you know, and it could be indirect because, you know, for those people who aren't watching the YouTube video, I am very blonde and very pale and burn like, <laughs> I don't tan. Right. Um, the only way to tan I learned years ago when I started my weight loss journey was, um, I could, if I go out and lay out in the very early morning sun, when the UV rays are really low, yep. then I might tan, but it takes, you know, it's like slow building yep. of beige. I'm not ever going to be bronzy and that's fine. I'll just <laughs> stick to pale. It's, you know, it's better for me anyway, but my mom seems to have like just a little bit more cognitive awareness just it's like she's just like a little bit more on she's like a little happier a little you know she's just a little better which is not really the best description and then years ago i read that you know we're so so hypersensitive about sunburn and skin cancer and all that you know you see the parents just slathering their children with sunscreen that we're not absorbing the sunlight from you know when we're outside now when i go cycling I look at the UV um, index and I I will go out now in the summer. I usually will ride 15, 20 minutes and then add sunscreen right now while I'm wearing long sleeves. So it's pointless to put on sunscreen, but it's like, even though I burn really easily, I, I can, I've learned how to gauge how much sunlight I I can deal with. And then I put on sunscreen so I don't get burnt. And it's like going outside and riding my bike, even though it hurt last mm. week. <laughs> Was you know, good, it's though. Just, and it's and we're socializing, so that it's hitting all of the important things. And but it's time consuming, and I know I'm blessed because if my mom lived with me, that would not be anything I would do. Going right. to the gym would be a challenge. Okay, so actually, let's talk about some things that caregivers can do in. In situations like that where they're at home and they don't have a lot of time and ways that they can give self-care to themselves. So you just talked about biking, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, we've talked a lot around food and supplements and things like that because caring for your body. So I talk about the biome a lot and I've studied the biome a lot because I discovered how linked it is with the mind. Mm -hmm. So our ability to be able to take stresses and manage those or be okay with those instead of having to manage them and, you know, 
and, and just always being on edge or irritable or frustrated or overwhelmed has a lot to do with our diet. It's surprising what these little guys do for us. And I'm not kidding when I say this, anxiety, depression, um, like that constant stress has a lot to do with what we do in our body. So we experience stress through a few ways. One of them is through food. Hmm. It, and it can be one of our major stressors on a regular basis. And then we have our environmental stresses. And then we have our mental stresses, whatever we're thinking, right? Think, 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 think. So um, it's really important to kind of just be aware of what you're doing. So I talk about food a lot, but I mean, I'm a mindset expert. <laughs> And I'm a hypnotherapist and I've done a lot of things that can help people. But I, I seriously, I think this is the first and foremost way to help people the best because your thinking will change with what you're eating because all of a sudden I'm producing these great neurotransmitters that allow me to manage stress instead of being freaked out. So now I'm not thinking from the same space. I can take it. I can manage it better. But let's talk on the other side. Okay. So I'm a caregiver and I'm in a space where I have very little time and I need to do things for myself. And honestly, bubble baths are nice. <laughs> baths actually are really interesting because water is very conducive to emotional release. So showers and baths are actually an excellent place to kind of release emotions. Hmm. Um, it's very interesting about water, but but when it comes to self-care, this is us filling ourselves back up with things that light us up inside. And caregivers are notorious for doing everything for other people that light them up or help them at the cost of dampening themselves. So you caregivers out there, all you beautiful people, such big hearts, love you. <laughs> there are a few things you can do to help really quickly change states for yourself. So when you get into these moments where things feel anxious or you're feeling stressed out and overwhelmed, breath work works really great. So you can do a breath that will take you from your parasympathetic nervous system back into your sympathetic nervous system, which changes your state of mind, changes your state of body, changes your heart rate, and allows you to be a lot more creative and problem solving solution finding and honestly that's where we thrive right mm -hmm. so it takes us out of our um our back brain or primitive brain or protective mind whatever you want to call it and moves us back into our frontal cortex so breath work and we do this like this i'm going to actually give you this <laughs> <laughs> you're going to take a breath and i'm going to teach you a few a few things with this so bear with me this breath is going to be a count of, it's slow breath, it's a diaphragm breath, which means your ribs are moving outwards, you're breathing through your nose, and you're pulling it through, and your stomach should expand. That's a diaphragm breath. We typically breathe very shallowly as a norm. It's just what we do. This sets off our parasympathetic nervous system more times than not just with our breath incredible, right? Mm -hmm. And parasympathetic means fight or flight. I'm ready to go. And your body's state is completely changed. So you can't manage stress the same way. You're not thinking the same way. And your body's not responding the same way. All due to breath. Okay. So we can change that just by taking some of these breaths. So if we take this deep diaphragm breath, slow, 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 and we breathe in for a count of five, hold it at the top, for two to three seconds, and then breathe out for a count of five, hold it at the bottom for two to three seconds, and you do this for a minute, two minutes, you're going to notice a massive difference in the way that your body feels, in the way that you feel, in the way that you're thinking, everything will shift. Wim Hof is the king. So, so many guys, so many people know this guy is the ice man, but he's all about breath and what you can do with breath. And it's amazing what we can do with breath. We can, we can take breaths that make us feel like we had a cup of coffee, all with your breath. Interesting. You can do the breath that I just described, and I'm gonna add one more piece to that in a sec, but you can do that, and that's a stabilizer. So that's your balancer breath. And then you can do ones that'll help you go to sleep. 
And all of these require no cost, no side effects, no potential harm to you or cross side effects with something else. They cost you nothing and they give you everything. And it's a simple tool. So the one other element I want to add to that breath is I find this is really connective to also changing your state of brain frequencies. And that's a whole different conversation to be had. So we're not going to go there, but just know that this helps. <laughs> okay. So any of you who've practiced yoga in the past have probably heard about ujjayi breathing. Ujjayi breath is more of a constricted breath. You feel it more in the back of your throat. You'll get this more when you breathe through your nose. Do not do this through your mouth. You breathe through your nose and it, you can hear it. So if I do this, I go like this. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> I can't tell. I can hear it too, but I'm not sure. It could be just coming from me. That's true. <laughs> so you can hear your breath and then you're going to breathe out. So if you breathe that way, when you're doing your diaphragm breath, you're changing your physiological state and you will, it, it just helps so, so well. One simple tool. So you can take a stressful moment, calm it right down within two minutes, three minutes, just some breath. So that's a balancing breath. Another thing for you awesome caregivers, often you don't know how to receive the gifts of love that life has given you, right? Because you're yes. giving so much. And trust me, I have many, many caregivers I have worked with and many caregivers in my life, beautiful people beautiful people, but they are horrible receivers. One that I am very in touch with right now, she's a good friend of mine and a heartbreaking. She just went through a really bad depression and this is really common with caregivers. And we were just talking about how they end up hospitalized or they end up dying way before. There's reasons why, because you're taxing your body and you can't receive. Mm -hmm. You can't receive all the great things that are coming with life because you're giving so much. So simple things like with her, she went through this depression. We were talking about being able to receive and she's like, oh, 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 oh. And literally affronted by like the conversation around, can you receive love from your children? She, cause she loves her kids, but she can't receive it even from her kids. And she recognizes this, this is amazing. She's actually at this point now, but she's like, oh, oh, oh. Like, and I said, okay, Let's try this. We're going to try something simple. And I said, if you do a journal, okay, you're going to write this because there's, there's something that happens when you actually go into writing things. Um, you're kind of touching all of your um, emotional, mental, and heart space, physical space. So it's a, it's a really good practice anyways. So you're going to write three times. I am open to receiving love. Actually, I said to her, I am loved or I am lovable. And she's like, oh, I can't do that. And I oh, went, all right, no. I, I, let's meet you where you're at. And you say this, but it's amazing. It's amazing how far caregivers can go down this hole. So if you're at this space where you're really down, down and you don't feel you anymore, this is going to help you. You're going to write this three times a day or th sorry, you're going to write three sentences the first day and it's going to be wherever you're at. Okay. So, um, I am lovable. I am loved. Or if you're not there yet, start a little bit lower, which is where she started. Cause I said, okay, you can't do that. What can you, what can you do? She said, I could say I am open to receiving love. And I said, okay, let's start there. So you're going to write this three times the first day. The next day, you're going to write it four. The next day, you're going to write it five. And you're going to add one on every day. And after about two weeks, you'll be able to bump that up to a better statement. Instead of, I am open to receiving this, I am receiving this, or I am accepting this, or I take this and embrace this. Or you start to use more and more of getting to the point where you recognize that you are loved and totally supported with all the things around you in your life. So the whole concept around I am loved, <laughs> this is truly an epidemic in our world. We believe we are only enough when. 
You're good enough if you get these grades. <laughs> you are worthy enough if you get into that school or you get that job. And you are loved if you do this and this and this. But if you don't do this, it's not, it's conditional. That's we're, true. We're conditioned to believe that love is conditional and it's not. And when we come from a space of complete wholeness within ourselves, there we're overflowing. And the whole concept of caregiving is a byproduct, is a byproduct of us because we can't help it. We just overflow and it's easy. So giving back to ourselves is absolutely crucial. So the journal is an excellent way to start depending on where you're at. And if you're not feeling loved, start telling yourself how freaking amazing you are because you are. And you always were. And there's never, ever been a moment that you weren't. And even when you make what we consider to be mistakes and these colossal whatevers, there's other things playing out in that. Know that it's not just about these conditions and the judgments that we're placing. Okay, so there's two tools. Breathing, really good one. Now, I said, okay, I have two kids. I run a business. I have a busy life and it got to a point where I, I loved yoga, but a class is an hour and a half long and I had to drive there and then I had to drive home. So that's over two hours of my time and how much of that can I give? And when you're starting a business, which is what I was doing when I first stopped doing that, I was like, I don't even have time to do this. So all of a sudden workouts went out the window and I went, oh, this isn't okay. I still need to move this body. So how am I going to get this in? So I found really efficient ways to get workouts in. So I do now, because again, this works very nicely with the way I eat and feed my body, but I do workouts now that are called HIT or Tabata. Mm -hmm. Or you no, do- No, <laughs> I love them. I no, love them. No, I hate them. <laughs> uh, I do them. Because they basically work you to fatigue, right? You just go hard to fatigue and then you're done. But they're really quick. They're a way to- absolutely replenish it sounds so funny because you're using lots of energy right but within a very short period of time that energy is compounding in you and giving you back what you need those workouts will help you like no one's business and you can start it easier and there's always modifications always modifications when you're starting something new and I, I'm talking to a friend of mine whose daughter is a personal trainer and I love her. <laughs> I love this family. Um, and we're talking about hit and Tabata last night. And she's like, yeah, but when you get older, it's really important to do weight bearing. And I said, yes, but your body is weight bearing and hit and Tabata use body. They mm -hmm. use your body. And as you progress, you're putting more and more of your own body weight into the workout. And trust me, that is enough weight bearing on your bones and joints and muscles to build, to stay active, to stay healthy, and to move the energy around your body. So really effective workouts. Again, do the modifications in the beginning if this is new to you. And if you're really, really early in this, stretching, breathing, all this stuff will help, again, move energy through your body, which is what you need. You absolutely need to move that energy around your body. And that doesn't mean like rushing around like a crazy person. <laughs> God knows. <laughs> yeah, not that. <laughs> it feels like that sometimes. Like I'm like, I worked out today. I ran up and down the stairs 15 times and I did this and I did that because you're busy. It's not the same. So, and, and again, baths, I will say there is something to be said about taking a bath. If you can take that time to just quiet yourself down and be in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this I did one. that last week. I came home from the bike ride on Friday. So I rode on Wednesday. Yep. Ugh, body was screaming at me. <laughs> I did my normal Thursday workout, which is we do Tabatas in that class. It's nice. um, cardio and weight training. And Friday, I did another bike ride. Oh, my butt was really screaming at me on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and I came home and I. I just, I threw on some comfortable clothes, had some food, and then I worked. And at about 4.30, was supposed yeah. to have a get to know you phone call with a gal. She had texted me and she'd had an emergency with a client of hers. And I'm like, that's perfect. 
two minutes later, I am soaking in the tub because I'm like, like my muscles are all screaming at me yeah. and I'm tired because I haven't put this much effort into exercise. I mean, we've been walking dogs and unpacking boxes, which you think is right. enough. And then you go back to what you were doing. You're like, whoa, way well, out of shape now. But you're using different muscle groups too, right? Yeah. Well, I needed to get the bike muscles back. <laughs> I really do enjoy that. And what's the best thing is we moved from the top of a hill that was absolute hell to get up. I mean, the only way, the only time it wasn't hell is if you rode down from the house to the bottom of the hill and turned around and went back up because it was steep. And, you know, I am not super skinny and it just, you know, it was hell. So now I live in the flatlands. <laughs> so it was like, I'm so glad I don't have to get up that hill to get home because I'm not going to be able to ride up that hill right now. So it was, you know, it's just, I knew that I just, I needed to get work done. And then it was like, here's my reward. You know, this, I just soaked in the tub for, you know, close to an hour. You know, I listened, I, I had like a, just a silly TV show on, on my iPad sitting on the counter and just, ah, that was what I did. And it worked great. And then, you know, it helps. And I find I need the exercise to move the negative feelings through. Yeah, you know, like absolutely. My, you know, I, I try to, I like to walk with my mom, but because of her visual processing, she doesn't have any peripheral vision. So she walks behind me. Well, she's starting to be more frail, you know, with the arthritis and she, she fell on December 30th. So I, I really, really don't want her walking behind me. So this is how I triggered her was insisting that we link elbows. Nice. And, you know, and I, I didn't hold her tightly cause I knew that would annoy her. And even just that loose elbow to arm contact was too much for her. It just pissed her off after a while. <laughs> That's why she told me to drop dead. <laughs> you know, and it, and sometimes I can laugh at that, but I don't know. Sometimes what was... you can't. Yeah. I yeah. think I, like I said, I know when I, it was really interesting to have this negative visit with her on Monday and then immediately, that was Monday afternoon, immediately go into a workshop with the Alzheimer's Association. And the first hour was on um, communication. Yeah. And it was like, oh yeah, there's all the things I did wrong. <laughs> and, and I knew when learning. I was, yeah, learning. Yeah, but it, it's like, and this is what I tell people, here's my challenge. It's like, you know, I'm not visiting her so that she can trail, you know, 20 feet behind me. That's, you know, that's not why I'm there. Yes, the walk is good for both of us. Um, but a lot of the traditional communication techniques, they don't work with her. Right. Like we have to be really different is the, yeah. is my challenge. So I'm, I'm learning and it's, it's not fun. <laughs> it's good for my brain to, to keep processing all these situations. And of course, as soon as I think I have it dialed in then she changes and it's like, Ugh, it's so much fun. But, you know, I'm trying to keep her safe and do things that give her pleasure, you know, go to the park and watch children, which people laugh at because we're like creepy old ladies. We go to the park and <laughs> <laughs> we like to go to the pool and watch the little children too. <laughs> that just sounds I, funny. Oh, it is. It's, you know, and I have to be careful who I say that to because some people will then look at me like, you're going to do what? what? Yeah. <laughs> like, and I had one person say, well, at least it's you, you know, you and your mom and not two guys. Right. I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, I've had one instance where this lady had a school age child and a baby in a, in a stroller and mom sat down on one end of the bench. And I don't know if she was making space for us or my mom made her nervous, but she got up and moved to a whole different bench. And I was like, okay, that was a first, but at least she made space for me to sit there. So, you know, <laughs> See, there was a win. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, I looked at her and I thought, man, I hope you don't ever have to deal with this because you think dealing with two little kids is tough. Ha <laughs> That's nothing. This is much harder. And then I just thought, well, maybe she got up and, you know, I, I, I mentally thought the negative thought and then immediately said, no, let's move into the positive thought. And it was, it was yeah. a beautiful afternoon, warm, a little bit of wind. And I just literally put my head on the back of the bench, watched the trees blowing, watched the beautiful sky, felt the sun on my face. And it was just like, you know, so that's where I kind of try to fill up 
because yeah. she's watching the children and I could care less because eh. <laughs> even though my daughter's 28, it's like, you can only watch them slide down the slide enough times where it's like, okay, I'm bored now. So I try to take that outdoor time with her to help energize me and kind of refill up my tank. But uh, when it's she's trying to make... that... go, no, ahead. go ahead, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, when she trails behind me, like some whooped little old lady, that's, you know, I... third, third world person behind me, or, you know, she's arguing with me because I'm trying to, you know, keep her next to me or whatever, whatever sets her off. It's, it's hard to enjoy nature when she's being that way. What you said was really great about the, this is how I'm re-energizing myself. When I look up at the sky, it's blue, the trees, the, the leaves are moving. You're picking up senses. So as you're saying this, that's another great way to feed ourselves. Recognize what senses are being triggered in those moments. Recognize, I am seeing this. I am hearing this. I am feeling this. Recognize your body and acknowledge and appreciate it. Love it for what it's doing in that moment. You did some really great, that's a really great way to actually, um, to replenish ourselves is to move into the embodiment of the moment and really appreciate the moment. It's funny when I think about gratitude and what gratitude does. So there's a ton of physiological responses that we have in a gratuitous state, like Oh my God, 1,200 of them actually. Oh my. It's shocking what happens when we're in a gratuitous state, but we're joyful, right? And that's us feeling light and really great and loving. So it's another great practice is to be able to find the things you're grateful for in that moment. So you guys were in the walk. You got to appreciate the things around you. Now I'm going to put one on you. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. So what could you find, and, and I'm going to use two things with this, what could you find that would be something in the moment with your mom that feels not so much like a gift, right? She's walking behind you, it's, she's getting angry, she's frustrated with you even touching her arm. What can you find in that moment that you can be grateful for? Hmm, that's a challenge. <laughs> But it's a good challenge because the more you do this, the more you're going to find. And the more you're going to find, the easier it is to fill yourself up. So there's that. And then for the things that you're struggling with, again, I'm going to go back to the journal because a lot can be done through journaling. Um, write out the things at the end of the day when you have these visits or if you're in this every single day, write out the things in the journal that were frustrating and allow them to go. Like that's your dumping zone. So my, uh, one of my old assistants, she was wonderful. She was also an EMT and she mm. saw some horrific things and they experienced some serious traumas themselves. They are very much like caregivers from that respect that they experience a lot of burnout because their, their job is really stressful at times, can be really rewarding, but also extremely stressful. So for her, one of the tools she used was journaling. And so she'd dump it all at the end of the day. She'd just write out all the stuff that she was feeling and, and didn't like or, or the things that she was grateful for or whatever. She'd just dump it all in her journal. And what a difference it made between burnout and feeling okay every time she got a call or feeling stressed out and being okay every time she got a call and had to go out on call right? So it's, it's a really powerful tool, surprisingly, using a journal to be able to unload some of our emotional baggage that we're holding on to. Well, I have an interesting project that I started the very beginning of this year, January 1st, 2020. I, I'm a podcast addict. <laughs> it's because my brain is constantly, it's like, I, I cannot do um, meditation because I can't shut my brain off. It just I would challenge you on that because I teach it. Okay, I've I everybody have everybody can do it. <laughs> I've heard techniques that I'm going to try, um, but literally, yeah. I mean, I sit there in about 15, 20 seconds of trying to have just nothing in my brain. Yeah, but that's not meditation, by the way. Getting okay. nothing in your brain. I hate to tell you, but if anyone gets to the point where nothing's going through there, I I don't even know. That's not true. 
I think it's dead. But uh, maybe. It, um, <laughs> or or you're sleeping. <laughs> yeah, but it's like I so I'm a I'm a podcast <laughs> addict. Um, but I, I have read some some techniques and I gotta find the book that's basically like meditation. It's not meditation for dummies, but it's I think it's like the one minute meditation or something. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm listening to a podcast and they're talking about postcards. Okay. And I think my audience is probably old enough that they know what a postcard is. Picture on the front, here. Yep. a tiny little bit of words on the back. And to grow the podcast into a business, obviously I use a lot of social media. So I do a lot of Instagram stories and videos and little pictures of, you know, things with mom and things with my three dogs and blah, blah, blah. And when they're talking about postcards, my brain clicked the two things together and went, man, social media is like your personal life, everyday story, <laughs> but you're not keeping it in one place. So I have like this six by nine, it's a sketchbook. And I take, um, I'm also a photographer, so it makes this a little bit easier. Yeah. I, at the end of the week, find four to five, six pictures that I've done, or I might think, oh, this would be good for my little book. So my little book is a tiny little journal with a photograph and a description of what I did, like not the whole day, but it's like, here's my daily life. You know, we walked the dogs or we were moving and here's a picture of the donuts and the coffee that I bought when we were moving. And, you know, here's yeah. my mom being obnoxious. And it's just, <laughs> it's because regular photo journals, scrapbooks are holidays and the big events and the vacation. But how about like all the daily stuff, like the day that we got yeah. the acoustical panels built for my, my, she studio is what I call it. Yeah. You know, it's like, they're all from art. They're all photographs that I, I took. Look. And, you know, one of them is a barn that was over a hundred years old that burned down in one of our lovely fall fires that California gets now. So it's like, there's a lot of rich history in just your boring everyday stuff. Oh, but there's so much beauty. Yeah. And I've, and so I started January 1st and I've read back through it. And it's like, man, this is actually kind of interesting. I don't have a boring life. <laughs> and you can kind of appreciate like I look back, like um, there was, a, there's one where now that this happened on New Year's Eve, but my mom was, she was struggling to eat. And I kept, and I obviously asked her too many times. We'd gone on the 23rd of December to the assisted living's dining room. So mm -hmm. we go in the car, around the building, get out at the assisted living side of the community she lives in. And we eat in their dining room. It's, you know, she has no clue how far we've driven and it's convenient. And thankfully I did it on Christmas, New Year's Eve because it turned into a whole horrible nightmare. So she was, we got on the 23rd of December, she ate we had a little hamburger. Barely enough food for me. It's very portion controlled. So it helps keep my calorie count down and it's all she needs. So she was struggling to eat the hamburger. I'm like, okay, well, Next time we'll try something that actually uses utensils. So I got her something that I thought she could scoop with the spoon. Well, we had more trouble with that. And so I'm like, you know, it's like, if that's just too much problem, I'm like, let's just get you something else. It's no big deal. And she just, she, what would happen is she'd try to scoop stuff up. It would fall on the table. And then she, she has what I personally call Alzheimer's OCD because it's like, fuss and fuss and fuss and wipe the table, 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 wipe the wipey, 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 wipey. And it's like, okay, it was one noodle that hit the table. Now you've been doing this for, so I kept saying, you know, cause she wasn't getting enough nutrients. I mean, it's, it was a tiny little amount of food and she barely ate a fourth of it because she was struggling so hard. So one of these pictures is literally, she finally got fed up with me. She's got the cloth napkin in her hand, she put her hand up to her head and, and she's got her head turned away from me. So she's like, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just the funniest thing. And I have posted that on social media. So you, for those that are actually just listening, not watching the YouTube channel, you know, it, you could just tell, you could just feel the Henri, I'm done with you attitude. <laughs> well, and she's literally shielding you yeah. with, a, with she's this like, knock in in her hand. Yeah, I'm yeah, done I'm with done. you. Yeah, it, yep. was, it was all bad. And then it got, actually got worse from there because I think, I, I think she said, well, I'm ready to go back to my room. Okay. And so I, I tried to help her, you know, get up out of the chair, not help, help, but kind of like offer help. Yep. 
whoops, nope, that was an affront. And she literally, and then I'm trying to help her and you know, I'm holding her jacket like anybody, like, see, obviously my mom cannot accept, you know, she cannot accept she's, being she's loved. Not receiving. She's not receiving any of this stuff. It's very yeah. annoying. Um, so I'm holding her jacket so that she can put it on. And I have learned the technique where you put your arm through the sleeve and you say, give me your hand. And then you just pull yep. their arm through the sleeve, not pull it hard, but yep. makes it so much easier than trying to like shove, you know, this works with little kids too. Yes, it does. <laughs> and she's fighting me and I'm like, fine. I just like basically dump the jacket, the rest of it over her shoulders. I'm like, okay, okay. And she stops off in a huff and this poor gal that she's got to be in her 80s she's the activities director at the assisted living side she comes over and she says she belongs over there in memory care and i'm like yes we're going back well do you want me to get somebody over there to help you I'm like no because she's already pissed off she's not gonna want somebody helping which right. maybe other people might have been okay i don't know this poor old lady had to help my mother into my car because my mother would not deal with me it was all ugly but i have that picture of her with the napkin up by her face. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote out the story and I know, you know, it's only been two months yeah. and I already look at back at it differently, but I read through the book the other day and it's like, you know, there's a lot of like, um, just rich details in your daily life. Like Absolutely. we just moved in and I'm making bread in my new kitchen. We've been here four days. I'm making bread. Yay. You know, it's like, and it smells good. Oh um, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is the challenge when you work at home, you just throw something in the slow cooker or the bread in the bread maker. And it's like, then you're just like, why am I hungry? Oh, because I've been smelling this food I'm for hours. This, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, I think journaling is really, it could be helpful. And I'm going to try writing that down, but I, I had a good experience this morning. Yeah. I was photographing. Um, well, I went from the house we had, had a studio attached. So now I have to go back to doing it on location, which is mm -hmm. reviving those skills, which is good for your brain, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. This is a past client. I've known her for a zillion years. She knows my grandmother, who's almost 102. And she asked me how much. And I, I told her, and she goes, Oh, that's a really good deal. And which at that point, I'm like, Should have given her the new price. And so I said, <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> I said, you know, you've been such a good long time client. I'm giving you the old price. And she goes, what's the new price? You're so worth it. I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I said, totally good. up to you. I said, and I told her the new price, only $30 difference, not a huge deal. And she goes, you're so worth it. And I said, thank you. You know, it's like, right. I, you know, when we try to downplay oh, a compliment, yes. it's really not, I find it like when you accept a compliment, like hear it smile, say, thank you. Thank now you. you've made your day better and their day better. Okay. So it's so funny that you say that. Cause I'm thinking about what you said about your video journaling. And I'm like, that lights you up. That's a way we replenish, right? The things that light us up, the things that make us happy. Some people it's dancing, some people it's singing, some people it's, some people it's reading, whatever it is, whatever lights you up, do it, do it and do more of it. Even if you do it in small little increments, but what you just said about thank you so my friend that is struggling right that i said do this journal thank you was one of them because okay so when we're not receiving well it's one of the first things it's one of the first things we do oh thank someone says oh your hair looks really great oh it looks terrible i had this done and uh, you know uh, I slept on it. It's sticking up, whatever stupid stuff we say. Right. Or, Oh, you, you, did you lose some weight? You look great in that dress. Oh, I got this on sale. We just brush it off. We brush it off. We're not accepting it all. So in those moments, just shut up, <laughs> shut up, just say thank you. And don't say anything else. Just say thank you. It's the beginning of learning to receive. It's the beginning. It's the first step. It's like the baby step. <laughs> But it's amazing the impact it has once you get used to saying thank you. It's like, oh, I actually really do appreciate that comment. So I had the weirdest thing happen when I was, uh, the kids were pretty young and I was in postpartum, didn't know it. And for me, postpartum meant adrenal fatigue. Actually, my adrenals were kind of really in a lot of trouble and I wasn't managing stress at all. So I would just get really upset 
or really uh, like irritable or I, I just wasn't okay the way things were happening. So I'm dropping the kids off at a birthday party and literally just out of the vehicle and I'm coming around the other side and I'm mad and I'm about to drop them off at a party, right? <laughs> Should be happy getting rid of them. I should be happy, right? And I love my kids. I love my boys. They're amazing little people. We went through some interesting times when they were young. Um, and part of that was my own awareness. A big part of that was my own awareness. But um, so this, I'm about to open the door. And this guy, young, younger, probably like 15 years younger, stops me, taps me on the shoulder. And he says, I just want you to know you're beautiful. And then he walked away. And I didn't see it as like, you're pretty. It was like, he looked right into me, stopped me to say, Hey, Hey, this isn't about this crazy moment that you feel is, you know, everything in chaos or whatever we're experiencing in our external world. It was like, he stopped me to remind me of who I am inside, right? The, the whole me, the authentic self. So he, he says this. And I'm not kidding, like I still talk about this. I've written about this incident because it's so profound. It was a random act of kindness. First of all, one of the nicest things a complete stranger has ever done for me, ever. I've had some really interesting things happen in my life, but that's probably one of the most significant ones. It cost absolutely nothing. Well, I could see people being like, what's this, you know, especially it's like, excuse me. What's the intent? Yeah, it's she like- just walked away. He well, didn't that was stick probably around. smart. He didn't, he didn't give you time to like give him no. a third degree. <laughs> or any of that, right? So, it, but it gave me an opportunity to like course correct right in that moment of like, I'm mad about to open the door to get my kids out. And it, it literally changed all of that in a snap. He replenished me with a kind, well, like an act of kindness. So the ways that we can give that also help feed us too, right? So now I find myself, I'll be at the grocery store. Actually, this was a very interesting incident recently. I'm at the grocery store and it's busy. And this poor cashier, she's putting people through as fast as she can, but it's like, it's busy and people are like cranky and whatever. So the first person that goes through, I'm three people in line, like two in front of me and then me. And then there's more behind me and... Anyways, um, first person doesn't even look at her, doesn't even acknowledge her, doesn't nothing. That's weird. Okay? First person. Second person is like speaking at her, like just kind of, I, I don't want to say abusive because they weren't, but they were just not nice. They were just not nice to her at all. And it's whatever's going on in that person's day, right? They're experiencing some garbage. And so they're just dumping it out on them right? They were hungry they're just, and they're hangry, <laughs> right? And they're just dumping it out on the cashier. So I'm looking at her and I'm thinking to myself, this poor woman. And you can just see like everything about her, her shoulders are slumped in a bit. Like her demeanor is showing the weight of this day. Probably like I looked when I got around that vehicle, right? And so I, I look at her, I see her name tag and I'm like, hi, Julie, or whatever her name was. And um, how are you today? How's your day going? Um, you've been doing such a great job. I just want to say thank you for like getting us through as fast as you can. And seriously, her whole body just went like this. She just like opened right up. She lit up like her face changed. Everything about her changed in that moment. One, someone recognized her as a person, right? She just got acknowledged. How often do we get acknowledged in a day? Sometimes not at all. And you caregivers are giving often in a place where the person that you're giving to is not appreciative. Mm -mm. So there's no acknowledgement there, right? So for her, that acknowledgement in itself was probably massive. But then just being able to recognize she's human, asking her about her day, complimenting her, giving her what she needed in that moment also fed me. I got something from that because I recognized what that did to, for her, right? So I'm able, to, I'm able to receive something incredible through something I do for someone else. Now, you caregivers are always giving for someone else. 
but recognize when you can do this in a way that actually replenishes you too, right? Simple little things like saying, hi, how's your day to the person in the line in front of you? Or, um, or being able to receive those moments when someone says weird things to you on the street, like, hi, <laughs> or makes <laughs> eye contact with you and you're like, oh God, I can't look at that. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with them? Who are you and what's wrong with you, right? People are trying to connect with you. It's okay to make eye contact. <laughs> it's funny because I, the more I deal with my mom and senior citizens, elderly, I find myself smiling at people, especially older people. Yeah. I, the grocery store that we shop at is, it's basically right in the middle of all of the retirement neighborhoods. Yeah. And there are certain hours. Don't go. <laughs> there's the moms picking up the kids from school and then there's the grumpy senior citizens and there's time, <laughs> God forbid when the two of those meet, it's just like all hell. And like I have found, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like, you know, I don't know how those cashiers get through that because, you know, it's like you got screaming little kids and you got grumpy old people. And it's like, ah. But I just find, you know, like sometimes you could see somebody walking down the street and you, being a photographer, I'm always looking at people like, oh, what? Right. You have to analyze somebody to know how to photograph Capture them. Capture the moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, or just photograph them in the best way. You know, I, when I do pictures of myself, I can always tell, oh, that's not the best angle because my face looks wider and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So right. I'm always looking at people because they're interesting. They are. And it used to be when they'd catch me looking at them, I'd look away. Like I was doing something wrong. I'm like, I'm just looking at you. <laughs> I'm like, I like your outfit or your hair looks interesting or whatever. Right. Now I just smile at them. And it's like, even if they just look at me like, why is she smiling at me? And I get this weird face. I still feel better. And, and most uh -huh. of the time people look back and they smile. I think it's reflective reflexive there we go yeah because you smile at them they smile back and then maybe as they pass you they're like why am i smiling at that weird chick <laughs> ah but you but, know what else happens too they smile back at you and that actually like lightens you up a bit mm -hmm. so even though they don't recognize that oh who's that weird chick for that second for that moment for that just brief moment you did something that helped them raise them up it's awesome yeah it's just, yeah, it's just, a, just little... a smile I'm going to have to take my mom to places where more people are because then it'll be, maybe there'll be more people to smile at and be easier to deal with her. That might be a, might be a thought. Hmm. It's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting because being unappreciated and not being treated like an adult, I think is one yeah. of the problems with people like my mom. And it's not that they don't treat them like an adult. They do. But when you have no idea how to shower yourself, Somebody has to do it for you a couple times right. a week. Or if you need somebody to help you dress, you know, obviously that's what you have to do with little children, not with somebody who's 77 or 87. Right. And so I'm going to think on those things and see if there's a way of shifting my mom's attitude towards receiving help in a positive way. <laughs> it's something interesting too, as you're talking about this, again, I just, I can't help but see both sides. So I can recognize the absolute frustration because there, it feels like they don't appreciate you and you, you, you're giving. It's hard when someone gives to you and you don't receive it. Sorry. When someone is giving something and the gift is not received, mm -hmm. right? If that's hard on the person that is giving the gift, it is because they think something's wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> Well, it's You're interesting. Being the beautiful human being you are. Thank you. It's interesting because I used to, you know, my mom's been in the memory care for three years and I'd be like, now I, I do go on a Monday afternoon, but I would hear, oh yeah, so-and-so's family, they're hardly ever here. I'm like, this is your mother. Like, this sucks. I'm not going to lie. I don't want to come here every week, but I do. You know, my husband, like on Monday was like, if she's being physically abusive, why are you going every week? And I'm like, right now I don't have that answer other than she's my mother and that's what I should be doing, you know, like duty. I'm right. like, that's not, that's not really a positive answer. So let me get back to you on that one, which I still haven't really come that up with. a sense of responsibility though, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you pay very good money for these places, but she's still family. I don't know. It, that's a really yes. tough question to answer. But when I was growing up, we were talking about 
you know, conditional love. I never felt like anything I ever did was good enough. You, you could get a B plus on a test. Why didn't you get an A? You yeah. know, you're taking four classes in college and, and getting a B plus average. Why aren't you doing five? Or you're, you're doing, the, you know, it's, it's just, I could, I could have, you know, swam the fastest race in the swim team and it still wasn't an, you know, it's like, that's just how my parents were. And I don't know why. A lot of parents and, are like that though. Yeah. And I, I see it. It's actually a struggle I have with my husband because I'll do things and I'll be like, why do I feel like whatever I do for you is not enough? And it's like, that's a theme in my life. So when I visit my mom and I'm giving and I'm doing things for her and it's like, lady, <laughs> one, you didn't visit your mother once a week, much less, you didn't go once a month. So I try to remind myself that I am doing phenomenally better than she did. Not that it's a race or, you know, it's, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to one up her, but it's like, I have to remind myself why I, why, oh, no, I, what I'm doing is plenty, even though it's only an hour and yes, we had a fight or whatever, and it's hard. It's hard to constantly remind yourself that I'm doing everything I can. I'm doing as best I can. I'm doing enough. It's ugh. <laughs> Okay. So ask yourself, hmm. it's interesting because it isn't, it isn't just about you being enough and, and growing up believing that we're not enough. And if that's a theme in your life, that's something that needs to be recti rectified. Like that sense of feeling like we're not enough is because, okay, so I talk about original meanings. I did this in actually today's podcast that went out today. I talked about forgiveness today and forgiveness from a state that actually really does lighten you. Because forgiveness is just as much about us as it is about the person or the experience we've had. So I come from a family of serious trauma when I was a kid. And it was really difficult to forgive some of the things that went down and to forgive the people. So when you start to do forgiveness work, um, you realize that it's them and their original moments that are now playing out as adults. So I talk about the original meaning or the original moment. It's us in our childhood when we're placing meaning on our whole world around us. We have no conception of what this is, right? It's just this big foreign, and we're so rudimentary at that point with our own cognitive skill sets. Like we have none. We're developing them. That's the meanings, right? So you look at me, you smile. I know that this is good. Now I have a meaning. You look at me, you look frustrated. Now I have a meaning. Your facial expressions, the way that your body moves, all of these actions and verbal, um, verbal triggers, all of these contribute to my meanings. And then they perpetuate throughout my life. So if that meaning, the original one, was that I'm not enough, it's going to keep playing out until I resolve it. And a lot of caregivers take from this space. So caregivers usually find that others are dependent on them and they draw from that. They mm -hmm. draw a fill from that. They feel like they're good enough through that. I'm helping you. You need this. Therefore, I am good enough. Sweetheart, you are always good enough. It's funny because as adults, we think, okay, well, you know, I was, I did all these things. I was good. I was, we can rationalize as, as adults, right? So mm -hmm. I have this experience of my, let's say my parents both worked, which this generation will experience this. My kids will experience this, but um, both, both parents are working and maybe working a lot. So as a child, I may see that because I'm in my rudimentary thought processes. I don't have enough cognitive awareness to, to rationalize this and go, oh, they're doing this because they love me and they want to make sure that I'm provided for and all these things. They don't do that. They're in like simple thoughts. Like they don't love me because they're gone or I feel abandoned because they're not here or I'm not good enough for them to not be here. There's a lot of things that play out from our childhood or that we experience in childhood that now play out for us as adults, and then how we manage that through our own actions and what we do. 
So the way that you see things going on with your mom has to do with some of the stuff in your childhood and the way that she's responding. So your mom sounds like she was a very, uh, she was very much in control in her life. In the household, yes. Right? She, was a, she was a stay-at-home mom, which is not what we called them back in the 70s. But <laughs> Right. She, she was just a mom back then. Right, right. Housewife was the term they used back then, which I know, oof, that almost, that's so, <laughs> such a oh, God, negative so term brutal. nowadays. It's, I know, it's terrible. <laughs> right, because it discredits a lot of what happens in the home and the responsibilities inside a home and raising a family. There's a lot, like there are many hats and jobs that a parent takes that stays home with kids. But so your mom was very much in control of her life. She is very Inside, much. She, my dad was in control because he had control of the finances. Right. But she learned how to essentially manipulate that and control. You know, there's a lot of control freaks in my family. <laughs> well, it's normal because people are looking for power that they feel they need to seek out. So she felt she had that control. And now she's in a position where no matter what she's doing, she's not in control. You have to hold my arm. I'm not in control. You have to tell me how to go to the bathroom. I'm not in control. You, you, you want me to take these medications? I'm not in control. I don't get to make that choice. So for her, everything is frustrating. I, could, I can totally understand that. I can totally understand that. That would honestly, because it's disempowering. She's in a moment well, in a stage, not even a moment. She's in a stage now that's disempowered. And for you guys, you're just giving. And your, your intentions are so amazing. And you're so wonderful. But she doesn't see it that way. No, nope. She has no power. <laughs> she has no power. She's in disempowerment. So it doesn't matter what you do. Like at there's, all. There's some things because she's very hostessy. She will ask other residents in the memory care or yeah. she'll tell them now if there's anything you need you just let me know which when i hear i have to laugh internally because like really <laughs> what are you going to do to help them you know because her you know her right. cognitive she ability wants to. she does she wants to so we are at the point where because she moved in in march three years ago and this is march essentially i you know they reassess them every year and i've tried to figure out if this is a good idea. This conversation has made me decide, yeah, it is. I think I'm going to have the, ask the director of the memory care, have the staff give her little helpful things to do. Like yes. can you put the napkins on the table. If the yep. napkins don't end up on the table, nobody's going to get hurt. We just more napkins, they're cloth. Yep. So, you know, might, there might have to be a few more, you know, a few extras which I find some of those cloth napkins folded up in her dresser drawers. And it's like, oh, it's like we're in the bathroom. It's like, oh Lord, I don't even want to know about that one. Um, you know, and just, that's the only one I can think of, but it's like, if I'm, if I talk to them about giving her purpose. Some power somehow. Yeah. Empowerment as maybe a better term. Yeah. Maybe that'll dial back some of the violent combativeness. Because then she feels somewhat in control. And then so think too, when you're with her, what's something simple that you can do that lets her feel like she's giving to you or that she's in control of the situation, right? So um, same thing happens with kids, which sometimes I'm good with and sometimes I'm not, but giving them only a couple options, but where they feel like they're the ones deciding and making the choice and they have the power Instead of saying, you this, you do that, I'm telling you, you have to go, you, you know, you have to set the table or you have to do whatever, right? Instead of doing that, give them some options so that they feel the power. They feel empowered in that moment. So in those situations for her, think of just little things you can do that allow her that power. Yeah, I'm going to have to think hard on that one because, what was it, back in September, when we visit her neurologist, her neurologist is great, spends lots of time with patients, which is yeah. not what United States doctors have the ability totally to do. do. Yeah. So she's always very far behind schedule. And I never know exactly how long it will take to maneuver my mom from whatever she's doing in the residence, in, out the door, into the car, across the yeah. parking lot, up, you know, it's like, could take 20 minutes, could take an hour. Um, thankfully it doesn't take an hour, but it's, 
you know, you don't want to be late to the doctor, even though she's an hour behind schedule. So when I got there, I said, she doesn't wait patiently. I know the doctor's always behind schedule. You tell me when, sh when should I come back? We're checking in now. Yep. I'm going to take my mom across the, the parking lot to get something to drink. So we walk into just basic hamburger restaurant, not a chain, um, like a real family run hamburger restaurant. And yep. I ask her, do you want an iced tea or diet Coke? Whatever you want. You just go ahead and have whatever. You I'm having iced tea. Do you want diet Coke or iced tea? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's like this passive aggressive so crap is enough to kill she me. She didn't want to make the choice, but you know what? That's great that you did it because I was just thinking like, that's a perfect example of, Ooh. okay, so we know we're going to do this, right? Like taking the medication or taking the supplements or whatever she's doing. So instead of saying, you know, you got to take these, it would be not the choice of you have to take these. It was, it would be more, do you want to take one of these now and one in 10 minutes? Do you want to, cause she still has to take them, mm -hmm. right? So you're setting it up. You're still getting what needs to be done or what needs, needs, you need to get across, but you're giving her some options so that she feels she controls that decision. Even though she doesn't make the decision. Well, I would keep trying with that. So in that case, yes, you're right. She didn't make the decision, but it's exactly the empowerment option you're giving. Yeah, so I'm, th I'm thinking it with the, the choice of beverage. Yep. You know, I asked her twice. Yep. And, and she just said, you, you decide. Well, yeah, first it was like, oh, you go ahead and you have whatever you want. And I said, well, I am, I'm going to have iced tea. Do you want an iced tea or do you want Diet Coke? Right. And then that's when I got, um, well, you know, whatever, blah, you know, it was just this passive aggressive non-answer. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to stand here and argue with you over a stupid drink. We're going to, so I just got two iced teas and we sat down and I said, you know, here's your drink. So maybe in her mind, she did have control and she did like not make a decision because she didn't choose A or B. Right. But it wasn't she felt the freedom of it that maybe that's all it needs to be. Cause it's like, okay, yeah. so that was, you know, six, six ish months ago. And in those six months I've been making the decisions because she doesn't she make, wouldn't them. make them. So maybe that's making it worse. Just give her options. Give her Even options. though, well, like, Oh, Hey, Diane, it's time to take your, you know, or I've got your morning medication. Do you want to take it before breakfast or after? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Like we have, it's time to take medications. Do you want to take it now? Or do you want to take it after breakfast? Because you're not changing the fact that she has to take it. Right. Right. And you're not telling her she has to take it. Okay. It's time to do this. Do you want to do it now? Or do you want to do it later? Do you want this choice or this choice? Then at least this way, she's choosing something and she feels empowered. It's interesting um, I learned that was one technique actually that was really good that came through some parenting courses that I took. Um, I found a lot of it. I was like, I don't know how to apply this, but that was one good one. That was one good one. How to empower your kids or adult uh, adults that are moving more into a regressive state of childhood, right? How to empower them in moments that they don't feel empowered because kids don't feel empowered either. That's true. And they feel resentful and unheard and unappreciated when they don't have a choice. So that's kind of like the same experience now that I look at it. I'm like, that's kind of the same experience where you're yeah, really similar, yeah. but it's hard when, you know, you give them an option and I didn't say, and then they don't choose it. <laughs> well, you, I didn't walk into the restaurant oblivious yeah. and say, Oh, do you want something to drink and a snack? Cause that's just, I mean, that's, that's almost too, too abstract, right? Well, and it's almost too many choices for normal yep. folks, which pay hey, air quotes around normal. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and it's, I go after, you know, my lunch meeting, so I don't need, I don't need any more calories. I don't need any more food. You know, I'd be more than happy to take part, but <laughs> I don't. Yep. So, you know, it was like, do you want A or B? And that's what I did when my daughter was like two do you want this outfit or this outfit? And we had very few arguments about outfits. Right. Um, and so it's kind of the same thing, but when they, 
you know, and, and I, I can totally see this might, might be the beginning of feeding the, the, the combativeness without knowing it is you didn't make a choice. So, you know, and I'm afraid that I'm frustrating you by asking you two and three times. So now I'm just making the decision. So I'm all, I'm almost thinking back to that afternoon because it was pleasant. You know, she was, she did great at the neurologist. I mean, the whole day was pretty good because she probably felt somewhat empowered. And then we had to go back to the doctor the very beginning of this year, 2020. And because of the stitches and the thing under her eye, we ended up, we ended up going to the eye doctor, which was a joke. And then she was having, because she's having so much pain walking, I'm like, well, we got time between the eye doctor and the neurologist. So I was well go to the urgent care about the pain. And my husband texted me uh, two thirds of the way through this afternoon. And I'm like, we're having a great day. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm gold medal in the caregiver today because we didn't have <laughs> any fights. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't, I mean, I'm like, first off, I hate doctors because they're just a pain in the rub. I mean, like they gave her an eye exam. It's like the woman's brain doesn't process the visual input. Why are, like, we're here right. for the thingy under her eye. It was so frustrating. And I just laughed like, okay, give her an eye exam. Oh, you're in good state. Yeah, like I don't your know. energy was in a good state. I guess I need to figure out where how to get that back, but I <laughs> because I know because my energy was good, hers was good, and, she, and I actually outlasted her because she started getting frustrated about the sundowning time of day. She gets she starts to get a little bit obnoxious about three thirty four o'clock, so yeah. I try to cut my visit off before that time, and the neurologist appointment was at three or three thirty, so. The neurologist got to see a lot of the combative non-compliant because yep. after the appointment, my mom's like, well, I'm going back to my room now. And she insisted on exiting to the right instead of exiting to the left where you're supposed to exit. Mm -hmm. And the neurologist tried to redirect her politely and kindly. No, it's this way. And my mom's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And she stopped and like <laughs> let her out the back door. <laughs> And I'm like, whatever, you know, and I guess yeah. maybe because I knew they needed to see all that. I yeah. was just like, whatever. Well, I was having yeah. a way, let it be day. I need more of those. <laughs> a little bit of breath work will help you in that too. Literally, like we'll just help you drop into that state so that you can be a little bit more in the flow of what is instead of the frustration of the energy. It'll help her energy shift too. I wonder if too is because I wasn't in control either. I had to wait for the doctors. They weren't doing what I thought they needed to do. And I've learned, you know, you, you just can't argue with them. And most of them, you can't even, you know, I try to explain to them, don't ask my mom three questions in a row because you're just going to piss her off. Well, and it's, it's, she can't process that fast right? You or, know, or that it, much. It frustrates me that I have to educate doctors on Alzheimer's, but I, I recognize that, that I have to do that. And, and I try to tell them in a, helpful, positive, not like you're an idiot. You should know this kind of tone of voice because that obviously isn't going to go well. What do you mean that's not going to go well? Yeah. Like, yeah, let's just see how many people I can piss off at once. But I'm wondering now I'm looking back at that day because I'm still amazed that we managed to get through all of that with the pain and they put drops yeah. in her eye. I mean, like the whole yeah. day was just geared up for explosive combative rage and we didn't get any of that really. And I'm wondering if it's because I wasn't as in, you know, it wasn't me in control. Yeah. Something to think about. See, this is why I do this podcast. It helps me. <laughs> so it's got to help other people too. <laughs> uh, and, and it's just, it's, and I, I, I enjoy, you know, like these little, you know, light bulb moments in the learning, because now I'm obviously going to be thinking about that day at the three different doctors mm -hmm. and the giving her empowerment, seeing how I can figure out how to make that work. And yeah. I got three days before I go visit her again and see yeah. if we can have a much better time this time. And the other thing that popped into my head is we were sitting outside on a bench. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting next to each other. Yep. And I need to sit in front of her so she can see me better. This is great. It's like light bulb moments. So I hope we're I hope we were able to give my listeners, some light bulb moments today. There's a lot in here. There's so much in here. <laughs>
That is true. It's a very difficult thing to, to live with. And it's, yeah. you know, there's, and because everybody, every, every person is different. Every brain is different. Everybody yeah. experiences Alzheimer's or dementia differently. So what yeah. works for me doesn't always work for somebody exactly. else. So. And the techniques that I gave today, because there's lots of them, never feel you need to do all of those in one day, ever, ever. Pick you know? and choose and find the things that work for you. Like if you find two things out of today's podcast that will help you use those. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.